Hello. You have a speaker. Hello. How are you doing, Brian? Good. How are you? Do you want to be able to share from that? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. All right. You should now have the awesome uh, privilege, but with privileges come responsibilities of being co host. <laughs> All right, let me see if it works. And all the responsibility there. Yeah. Or, oh, that's better. Does that look okay? Yep. Okay, cool. Slightly pixelated, but you could try full screen, I suppose. It's a little pixelated. Mm, no, it looks it looks just fine. Okay. Giving you a hard time. <laughs> Wait a couple seconds. Say this. I did decide to give this on my tablet, which is only black and white. So I, if it is pixelated, I'm a little worried, but hopefully it's readable. No, no, no. It's more than readable. Okay. Okay. Well, that depends on the content. <laughs> it's readable. Sounds good. We'll wait one more minute for the stragglers. People are joining you, Brian, from airplanes. You should be flattered. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I know. Hey, hey Brian. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tudor. <laughs> Are you in 32F right now, or what's the... Oh, yeah, it, 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 I am indeed. Can't, can't wait for the talk. <laughs> Thanks, Tudor. Thanks for signing in. <laughs> well, you got quite a nice crowd. <clears throat> Oops. I just I wanted to see the number of people that were here so I know how nervous I should be. Terribly. Yeah. All right, there we go. All right. Very good. Um, you ready to start? Yeah. I'll start recording then. So it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to this month's uh, WHCGP. And as always, the talk will be an hour with some questions after. But if you have questions during the talk, please feel free to type them in the chat. Or if Brian approves, just jump right in. So today we have Brian Williams from Boston University, who will give us a survey of holomorphic quantum field theory. Well, well, thanks, Dan, and to all the other organizers that invited me to speak. And yes, I definitely approve interruptions and questions. So please bring them on. Uh, as Dan said, my title is a survey of holomorphic QFT. Um, my goal is for the first, hopefully half of this talk to give sort of a colloquium style overview of the field. And then uh, in the last half or so, I'll uh, selfishly turn towards some of the contributions that I've made. Um, and uh, because this is a, a, a rapidly evolving subject, I wanted to list some names of people that are actively working on these things. And I'm really sorry if I Forgot any, um, these include some of my collaborators, but uh, also just foundation founders of the field. Um, I won't read them all out loud right here, but I just wanted to acknowledge these people um, as, as making the subject uh, sort of, the, the existence of the subject would not, uh, would, would be hard to, to claim without the presence of these people. Um, so yeah, here, here's, a, here's a plan for this talk. 
Um, so I'm going to start off by sort of going through just the basic uh, semi-rigorous definition of a holomorphic QFT. It can be made totally rigorous, but uh, I won't get hung up too much on the technical details, but I'll, I'll try to give the main idea. Um, in the second part of the talk, which is still more colloquial style, um, I'll say a bit about where they come from, why you should maybe care about them, um, sort of examples and quote nature. Uh, by nature, I mean supersymmetric quantum field theory, <laughs> uh, as close to nature as I can get. Uh, number three, uh, part three of the talk, uh, I will then introduce uh, some ways to study holomorphic QFT, some ways that are uh, have yielded some results already and some maybe more hypothetical slash work in progress uh, te techniques that are being developed. Um, and then four, uh, as I said, I'll, I'll turn to some applications and some more results that are more selfishly related to my work, um, consequences of my work. So yeah, I'm going to get begin with part one. What is a holomorphic QFT? And you all, hopefully, uh, many of you already know the most basic example of a holomorphic QFT um, in complex dimension one. This goes under the pseudonym of two-dimensional conformal field theory, um, which is a, a much more well-studied object in, in math and physics. Um, more carefully, this is the chiral part of a two-dimensional CFT. And I just wanted to say from the outset that the sort of beautiful relationship between CFT and say the moduli of curves, moduli of G bundles on curves has led to very successful progress in geometry, topology, rep representation theory, et cetera. And uh, Moreover, the development of, of mathematically rigorous techniques to analyze CFT, for example, the theory of vertex algebras has also been wildly successful in proving, formulating and proving theorems um, coming from physics. And it's those lessons that I wanted to, to learn and to try to transfer to the world of uh, more, more generally higher dimensional um, holomorphic quantum field theories uh, for which CFT is sort of the, the just the one dimensional version. Um, so as, as I just said, holomorphic QFT shares analogous relationships to these moduli spaces that I just mentioned, um, except now living in higher dimensions. So not just on algebraic curves or Riemann surfaces, but higher dimensional complex manifolds. And partly my goal is to develop the mathematical machinery to describe such theories. And um, this, um, no, no, no surprise, uses many ideas that we learn to be very successful in the world of conformal field theory, but also uses some ideas that are typically seen in the context of topological field theory as well. So a nice sort of uh, a smattering of, of, of two things that uh, mathematicians even uh, really like and can get their hands on. Um, so here's the, the main idea of a polymorphic field theory in general. Um, so a holomorphic theory is one which depends naturally on the complex or holomorphic structure of the geometric data. So what, what I can mean by that is, well, to talk about space-time, I need a manifold typically. And in the holomorphic context, I need that manifold to have a complex structure. Um, moreover, if I'm writing down a, a gauge theory or some theory which depends on some vector bundles, I'm going to require that those vector bundles be holomorphic, of course, um, as the name suggests. More accurately, and the one which lends itself to a, a rigorous definition using the theory of factorization algebra, say, it's, it's a theory whose, uh, I'll put in, in parentheses, derived, um, I'll get to that point as we go on, um, correlation functions. Um, and th these, are, th these are required to depend holomorphically on spacetime, which we have a complex structure on spacetime to even talk about a holomorphic theory. So this is a, this is a well-posed condition. And uh, personally, I would say that this is the most direct generalization of a vertex or chiral algebra, which underlies uh, two-dimensional CFT. So there, of course, in, in, the, in the world of vertex algebras, we've come to understand that that's really the structure of correlation functions between local operators. So just the operator product expansion um, of local operators in the CFT has the structure of a vertex algebra. Um, and in higher dimensions, it's really necessary to say the word derived here. That is not just working with sort of the uh, physical degrees of freedom that we're used to working with in CFT, it's, it's sort of necessary to derive that uh, 
condition um, in the context of higher dimensional holomorphic theory. And uh, the reason for that hopefully will be clear um, when we get to part three of the talk. And this definition, as I just pointed out, can be made rigorous using factorization algebras. Um, even such a definition appears in the book of Costello and Gulliam, uh, part two. Um, I'll point out, uh, if you don't like correlation functions, maybe you really like action functionals. I really like action functionals. And if a theory admits an action functional description um, and it's holomorphic, it has to take this particular form. So I'm writing a, an action functional here as a sum of two terms. Um, it's a quadratic term, the kinetic term, plus the interaction term. The quadratic term has to have this precise form. So what's important here is that the del bar operator appears. That's del bar defined on the complex manifold, or maybe phi is a section of some bundle. That means that this is like the del bar operator associated to the complex structure of that bundle. And uh, capital D here is just some arbitrary holomorphic differential operator. Um, and in many cases, like in the next example, this, this capital D can be taken just to be a constant zeroth order differential operator, namely just the identity sometimes. Um, that, that's a totally fine thing to do. Um, and I'll explain the interaction term here. So I'm writing the interaction as, as is any Lagrangian is a, a function of the jets of the fields. So that is a function of the fields and possibly its derivatives. The thing I'm indicating here is that what appears are only, first off, only the holomorphic derivatives. Um, uh, sorry, just th that's all I wanted to say. What, what appears here is only the holomorphic jets of the, of the field phi. So that's the, that's the typical sign that you're, that you're working with a holomorphic theory, namely your Kinetic part has this form involving the Delbar operator and the interaction part, interaction part involves only holomorphic uh, differential operators. So let's do an example, holomorphic uh, Chern-Simons theory. Um, so here's the, the geometric setting. So the, X here is a Calabia threefold. So already we're not in complex dimension one. This is a higher dimensional holomorphic theory. Um, it, makes mo it, it makes sense in more generality. So sort of versions of this make sense outside of the dimension three case, but this is somehow the most natural place for it. Uh, so we have a threefold. It has a Calabia structure. And uh, G is a Lie algebra. So the, the theory I'm about to build is very closely uh, analogous to a, another theory that we love in topological field theory, namely Trent Simons theory. And in fact, it's action functional takes almost the identical form. Um, I'm sorry, there should be. So, so let me just say what it is. So in this formula here, omega, that was the Calabi-Yau form. So we're in complex dimension three. So this is a three comma zero form. And the functional Chern-Simons of A, that's the ordinary Chern-Simons Lagrangian. And the formula on the left is totally rigorous, but uh, on the right-hand side, I'm going to expand it just because the left-hand side makes it look identical to the usual Chern-Simons theory. Whereas the right-hand side expanding it out, you see what the, the small difference is. And it's really a big difference. So, uh, Sorry, there should be a, a factor of omega that I carried over in both of these expressions. So when, when you expand out this Trent Simons Lagrangian, what you find is that what contributes to it is not just a, a connection, uh, the one form part of a connection, but just a zero one component of the connection. And that's because this holomorphic form omega appears explicitly. Um, So the, the fields of this theory are just the zero one component of a, of a connection. The Lagrangian looks very close to the usual Trent Simons Lagrangian, except importantly, what appears in the usual Trent Simons action, at least of the kinetic term is just the Durham operator. Here, what appears is the Delbar operator. So this is already of that form that I mentioned in the last slide. And the cubic part of the action 
is identical to the Trin-Simons action, except for the appearance, as I said before, of this Kolabiyev form explicitly. And you see here that in the dimension three condition is hopefully coming in in a, in a very obvious way. In order for me to get a density, something that I could integrate, um, I needed, I needed uh, to be working on uh, a threefold. So do we ever, for anything you're going to do, do we need to know a group G with Lee algebra little g? And is the, is this really a connection on a potentially non-trivial bundle or is it a connection on a trivializable bundle? I'm simplifying things here and just working with a connection on a trivializable bundle, as you said, but you could work just as usual to Simons, you can work, uh, well, here you need to work near any holomorphic G bundle. Yeah, but um, what I'm asking you... is for, for the oh. things that you're going to talk about, are we going to see those, would we see those subtleties if we tried to? I won't talk about exactly holomorphic Trin-Simons theory again. I will talk about uh, other sorts of holomorphic H theories where the, the same oh, feature, uh, th this feature that it won't matter which bundle we're working at will also be true. So I'm always going to be doing something sort of perturbative as you're getting at. Um, and as Greg just said, uh, the uh, so, so sort of what's going on here is geometrically is you should be interpreting this as a connection on a G bundle. And the equations of motion tell you that it's not just any old G bundle, it's really a connection on a holomorphic G bundle. Um, this mara Kroton equation coming from varying this action um, is exactly the condition that A is a deformation of the trivial holomorphic G bundle. Um, just to uh, relate to some physics context, um, this holomorphic Chern-Simons theory was was seen to uh, describe the open topological string field theory underlying space filling brains in the topological B model. This goes back to Witten, um, and that that's that's in the case where you have a, a matrix Lie algebra. Uh, here, this this made sense for any Lie algebra with a uh, with an invariant pairing, just like Trin Simons does, but in that special case, it has this nice brain interpretation. Okay. So, in in that in that same spirit, I wanted to say a little bit more about where uh, holomorphic field theories come from um, more, more generally. Um, so this leads me to part two of the talk. Maybe I'll stop here. If there's any questions, though, any more questions? Okay, so here's some sources of quantum field, holomorphic quantum field theories uh, in nature, and I'm very liberally using the word nature there. Hey, Brian. Um, hi. Oh, hey, John. Hey. Um, so you you've given us the classical holomorphic Chern Simons theory. Do you have anything to say about the quantum version? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So unlike ordinary Chern Simons theory, this Chern Simons theory is very sick. It has an anomaly at one loop. Um, so it actually doesn't have a quantization. Uh, this is a feature of holomorphic theories. Uh, like their sort of physical counterparts, there's often anomalies. This is not something we usually see in a topological field theory. We do see some versions of anomalies in TFT as well, of course. But this is a sort of anomaly that is, is uh, sort of more extreme in my opinion, because it's really internal to the theory. Uh, it's a it's a gauge anomaly, so we wouldn't be able to quantize this theory just on its own. Um, Kevin Costello and C. Lee have have uh, sort of explained a version of the Green Schwartz mechanism that makes sense for this holomorphic Chern Simons theory, which you can cancel this anomaly by by sort of canceling this anomaly by coupling some gravitational theory here, and that gravitational theory, no surprise, is is related to the B model on X, so it's sort of like a topological sort of string, gravita uh, gravitational theory underlying a, a topological sort of string theory. Um, but yeah, thanks, John. Hopefully that answers your question. So here's some uh, sources of, of QFTs in nature. So uh, as, as I was just getting at here, the quantization of some natural complex geometric moduli problems typically define holomorphic QFTs. So you should basically take any sort of moduli problem 
that you know of in say smooth geometry, which can be associated to an ordinary field theory and ask if there's a holomorphic analog. Um, some examples which will appear later on in this talk are, are mapping spaces. Those are called sigma models um, in physics. Uh, there's holomorphic G bundles, which we just sort of uh, introduced um, in the form of holomorphic Chern Simons theory. Um, and there's also there's other ones that I'll that I might say some things about too, like say variations of Hodge or Clavier structures on a on a Clavier manifold. Um, and uh, th this sort of theory has also appeared in physics um, due to the work of, of uh, BCOV, um, and they call this Kadira Spencer theory. Um, but that, that was the closed string field theory underlying the B model. We just talked about the open one now. Some other examples, uh, maybe more close to uh, physics now. Uh, supersymmetric field theories give examples of holomorphic QFTs through the process of, of twisting, which I will say some words about momentarily. So for example, the unique twist of 10-dimensional supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory is a holomorphic field theory underlying the moduli stack of holomorphic principal G bundles, now not on a Calabia 3 manifold, but on a Calabia 5, which is real dimension 10. So that's, that's just one example, but um, moreover, uh, more generally, supersymmetric field theories, their twists tend to give rise to other holomorphic quantum field theories. And in the same vein or similar vein, twists of string theories and theories of supergravity also give rise to such theories. So for example, the twist of type one supergravity, it's uh, sort of the minimal sort of supergravity you have in 10 dimensions. Um, is a holomorphic field theory which underlies deformations of complex structures on a Clavier 5. And um, similarly, uh, as, as, as explained by Kevin Costello and C. Lee, or at least conjectured, um, twists of 2A and 2B supergravity um, describe deformations of Clavier categories. So not just complex structure on a Clavier 5, but sort of non-geometric deformations as well. Um, Um, there's a question in the chat which says, can you say something about holomorphic theories enjoying unitarity or reflection positivity? So I, I will say that I cannot, but um, I will say that I sat in a very beautiful talk of Davide Gaiotto two weeks ago, which uh, so, so sort of the, the push for that talk, at least from, from, my, from my point of view, was about extracting properties like unitarity from the twist of some supersymmetric theory, or re really the family of twists of a supersymmetric theory. So I can say that uh, there are people like David thinking about that sort of thing, but I don't have any uh, thing to say about it. Uh, but thank you very much for the question. Um, maybe I'll, I'll kick that off to, to David a, as a, uh, if you're curious. So um, I wanted to un un unwrap a little bit about what I meant by twisting. Um, so start with supersymmetry. Supersymmetric theory on R to the D has in particular a symmetry by a least superalgebra of the following form. So here, uh, this pi symbol is just parity shift. So that's just telling me that sigma is underlying the odd part of the super Lie algebra or this least superalgebra. And V is the even part of this least superalgebra. V is the vector representation of SOD, so D dimensional. And sigma is a spin representation. And uh, these can take various forms in the context of supersymmetry. So uh, in dimension odd, it has the form S tensor W. S here is the irreducible, the unique irreducible spin representation. Um, in even dimensions, there's a, a sort of a dichotomy between being 0 mod 4 or 2 mod 4. In 0 mod 4, the algebra has the the representation has the following form. Here, S plus and S minus are the um, irreducible spin representations in even dimensions. 
Um, and in dimension in dimension two mod four, you have the special property that you can talk about chiral supersymmetry. So you don't have to include both S plus and S minus, you can include one or the other. You could also include both. And uh, this Lee superalgebra is very boring in the sense that the even subalgebra is actually abelian. There's not any interesting bracket there. And the only interesting uh, Lee super bracket is the symmetric one, which goes from two copies of the spinner representation to back to the vector. Yeah. And it's symmetric because of because this is a least super algebra, so that has to be a symmetric operation. Um, All of these vector spaces are complex. Not yet, but I'm about to. So uh, to talk about twisting, I, I will complexify. And uh, define a twisting supercharge to be an element of sigma complexified with the property that it's square zero. And it's going to be convenient for the next few slides for me to name the space of such things. That is the space of such twisting supercharges. And I want to throw away the zero, the zero twisting supercharge. So that's what I'll do here. And I also want to mod out by scale because um, for what I'm going to do, this process of twisting um, that I haven't yet got to yet, it doesn't matter uh, which scale I use. So I can use any non-zero multiple of the supercharge and I'll get the same answer. And um, well, this is a projective variety uh, clearly mod out by, well, well, clearly it's sort of affine version here, just given by uh, cutting out some quadratic equations, then I'm modding out by the scaling action. Um, this Moten's variety uh, was named the no potence variety in work of Igor Severi and Welker, who, who um, sort of, I, I wouldn't say originally introduced the concept of a variety of this form, but sort of made it uh, popularized in the context of, of supersymmetry. Um, But and there's a there's a similar variety of course defined for any sort of for, for any such Lee super algebra. This is very closely related to the Markerton space of the of the underlying graded Lie algebra. So I'll say a few more words about uh, about uh, supersymmetry here. Um, this is a selfish way that I imagine building supersymmetric theories, which is goes under the name of the pure spinner construction. So uh, it turns out there's a there's a nice supergroup associated to this super algebra, um, roughly taking its exponential. Um, this is a simply connected supergroup, and its its functions have the following form here. So uh, you could put this sort of in, into the context of a of a super manifold where the even part or the sort of core of that super manifold is just the underlying vector v. Um, and the uh, sort of odd bundle or the super, the, the bundle over this thing, which sort of defines the odd directions is the sigma. Um, and functions on this thing uh, just look like functions on V tensor the exterior algebra on sigma dual. Um, and because this is an exterior algebra, of course, only finally number of powers of, of sigma dual can appear in this, in this uh, expression. Um, just like in the usual theory of, of Lie groups, uh, this space here carries both a left and a right action of the Lie superalgebra N that we started with. And I'm going to use that right action to define a, a cohomological vector field on the product N times Y. Um, by cohomological, I'm being sort of, it, it's, it's a little wrong to call this cohomological. It's just an odd vector field for now. Um, but I want to think about it as being cohomological because it squares to zero. And in, in this product manifold, N here is that Lee supergroup that appeared above, and Y is that no potence variety that appeared on the last slide. Yeah. So, so using, using this right action, I can define sort of a universal vector field on this product space here. And there's a name for this, this vector field in the physics literature, it's called the Berkowitz differential, which is the sort of core uh, core piece in this in this pure spinner construction as developed by uh, Berkowitz and collaborators. Um, this this way of writing in here is is a, a nice sort of interpretation of the 
procedure sort of made made popular. I, I would I would credit this to Engmar Siberi. Um, so fr from from this space right here in this vector field, what we can do is we can build supersymmetric multiplets. That is representations for the supersymmetry algebra, which deserve which we can use to build supersymmetric field theories. So for example, the, the most canonical thing to do is to just look at functions like we did before and equip that with this cohomological vector field D and view this as a DG vector space. Uh, really, it's a DG algebra because I'm just looking at functions and D is a vector field. Um, and it turns out that this, this, this coaching complex right here is an off-shell model for many familiar supersymmetric multiplets. So, for example, in 10 d n equals 1 supersymmetric Yang Mills, if I start with the 10 d n equals 1 supersymmetry algebra and I look at this resulting coaching complex, it's equivalent to the multiplet underlying uh, the vector uh, supersymmetric multiplet in that dimension. Um, that was the, that, that, that's the multiplet underlying 10 d supersymmetric Yang Mills theory. And you could try to you could try to build more, so you can actually generalize this construction to uh, and have it make sense for any sheaf on Y. So there, there's a way to extend D to a complex of the form uh, functions on N tensor uh, a sheaf on Y. Um, and this still will have and maybe I didn't say it before, but uh, the fact that this is uh, a super symmetric multiplet is because I still have this left action uh, by vector fields. Uh, uh, coming from the least super algebra, the, the supersymmetry Lie algebra, and so I've I've used up the right one to define this differential, and there's still a left one around, which gives me my supersymmetry. And I won't do any more examples of more exotic sheaves in this talk, but uh, if you're curious, you can check out some of the the papers that uh, uh, Ingmar Siberi and, and collaborators have written in the last few years to get a good sense of some. Uh, some things that you can do with us, some theories that you can build with us. Um, so I'll do an example uh, for D supersymmetry. So here the uh, algebra that I was calling N before, it's the vector, which is R4 here, and the parity shift. So this is minimal. So I just have a single copy of S plus and a single copy of S minus. The bracket is the uh, SO4-ic covariant isomorphism of the tensor product of S plus and S minus with the vector. And here, the no potence variety has two components. And that's just because that every such vector in S plus or S minus is automatically square zero because of the form of the bracket. So you get, you get two components here, sort of dual to one another, or whatever paired. One's the sort of plus copy, the other's the minus copy. Um, and they're both CP1s. And uh, what we'll do now uh, is, is now uh, this process called twisting. So that amounts to fixing a square zero element. So here it's going to be, I'm going to take it to be Q plus inside of S plus. And it turns out that in this, in this dimension with this number of supersymmetry, it's easy to see that the image of this Q plus defines an almost complex structure on the vector representation just by looking at the image of its bracket. So the image under this under this isomorphism here of bracketing with a single Q. And you could think about this CP1 plus here. So here we're, we're working over just the uh, the component CP1 plus as a, as a twister CP1, which parametrizes orthogonal complex structures on R4. Um, so this is this is already maybe the, the first appearance of where holomorphic field theories are coming from. There's this natural appearance of complex structures when looking at 40 n equals one supersymmetry. Um, and this canonical multiplet that I just introduced in the last slide applied to this case, that also gives in this dimension the gauge or vector multiplet underlying minimal supersymmetry. So another, it's a very important multiplet. So let me give a quick rundown of twisting now. So just very loosely, let A Suzy denote some supersymmetric objects. This is some object which I can extract from a supersymmetric theory. 
So say it's it might be the observables, local operators, it might be the fields. I'm going to be pretty agnostic about that here. But in particular, what I know is that it's a representation for the least superalgebra n. Now, if I have a twisting supercharge, Q, the twist is, uh, at least at this level of rigor, is going to simply be the Q cohomology of this supersymmetric object here. So because it's square zero, I defines a differential, and I can take its cohomology. There's other very important concepts involved with twisting that I don't want to get into, but um, this is somehow going to be the important bit of, of, of the construction for me today. And naturally, we... I, excuse oh. me, I have a question. I have a question. Then. Please. So one, yeah. one, one nice way of thinking about twisting is that you're introducing certain background fields, typically are symmetry connections. Have you or anybody, you know, written out the detailed dictionary between your presentation of what twisting is and that viewpoint? So I, I would say Kevin Costello and C. Lee went some of that direction already. So they more generally discussed or d define what it means to twist a theory of supergravity. Um, so there, it's unavoidable to talk about things like R symmetry and uh, uh, space-time symmetries all, all, all together. Um, and it's exactly the, the thing that you said. It's, it's, it's like working in a background where some odd supercharge takes on some non-zero value, this, this being the non-zero value here. But as you said, more generally, if we have other objects that we want to preserve around, like say uh, some other space-time symmetries or R-symmetry, what you should really be doing is working with, say, the multiplet underlying the stress tensor that contains this, this sort of Q. And it's not just the Q that you need to choose, as you said, but you may need to choose some other background geometric data to make sense of this twist. Um, and I, I would say doing that sort of fully carefully has not been uh, explicitly written down uh, anywhere. But uh, the idea of what to do, I think, is, is, is there. Um, um, l l let me say a few remarks about this twisting construction, because now this is the first time the word holomorphic has appeared um, in this part of the talk. Um, so the, the first, first remark is that uh, you might have heard of topological twists. These have the feature that the dimension of bracketing with Q is as big as possible. And what that means is that every element of the vector, which we think about as being an infinitesimal translation, acts trivially in this cohomology, this twisting construction. So that, that's, that's at least one sense in which it's, it's topological. Holomorphic twists are sort of on the other end of the spectrum. What it, holomorphic twist is the, is the condition that the dimension of bracketing with Q is as small as possible. Um, and because of some non-degeneracy conditions in the definition of the supersymmetry algebra, which I didn't get into, what this means is that the dimension, and, and even dimensions at least, it means that this dimension is half the dimension of space-time. And in even dimensions, then what you should think of is that the translations which are in the image are the infinite, are, are the anti-holomorphic derivatives, uh, d by dz bar, um, which of course makes up half the half the dimension. The, the number of those is, is half the dimension. So, so sort of in, in parallel with topological, we don't have all translations acting trivial, but anti-holomorphic ones do. The holomorphic ones are still acting non-trivial. So you still have some, something that's sort of like a holomorphic energy here, if you like. Uh, these holomorphic theories are not like topological theories. They don't just, they don't just describe sort of zero energy limit of a physical system. They, they remember some more things. Uh, about the physical theory. There's also twists which sit between these two. So Kapustin twists say it in 40 n equals two or n equals four. This is where uh, you're not, you're, you're in between the minimal and the maximal possible uh, dimension of the image of, of bracketing with Q. So th those are like partially topological or partially holomorphic sort of twists. So here's a very short rundown. Uh, this slide is jam-packed with a lot of great ideas that I don't have time to get into. 
But I'll say that the notion of a holomorphic twist was considered back in the work of physicist Johansson in 1995 and Valois in 2010, um, where they considered, or at least Valois considered the uh, twist of this Tendi Yang Mills that I talked about before and related it to some sort of complex geometric object. Um, also, holomorphic theories have appeared sort of sort of outside of the world of twisting, but still within the world of, of, of physics has appeared in work of Losev, um, Greg Moore in the audience, uh, Nikita Nekrasov and Charles Feely. Um, and that, that was that was roughly in the 90s as well. I pulled 97 from a, a paper with some some title in it that was very uh, indicative of, of holomorphic field theory. But I think they were thinking about these things already in the 90s. Um, I'll say that uh, generalized now now more in the direction of twisting. Uh, Costello generalized Witten's original twisting procedure in 2011, and uh, refined the notion to give a characterization of holomorphic twist of 4D and 2D gauge theories. Um, a few years later, uh, Chris Elliott, uh, Pavel Safranov, and myself characterized the twists of all supersymmetric Yang Mills theory in dimensions two between two and ten. Uh, no surprise here, they all are sort of objects which are naturally in the world of complex geometry or a combination of smooth and complex geometry and those partial sort of intermediate twists that I just talked about. Um, and then uh, sort of more recently, uh, a variant of a supersymmetric Yang Mills theory, namely in three, uh, one that's possible in three dimensions, you're allowed to turn on some sort of Chern Simons term in these supersymmetric. Yang Mills theories, uh, you can also contemplate the twist of those theories, and, and, and we gave a, a description of those as well. Um, it's three dimensions, so it's not strictly something I would call a holomorphic quantum field theory anymore, but it's one of these uh, theories which depends on the complex structure of, say, a, a, a co-dimension one, uh, a co-dimension one uh, foliation. Uh, so th these sorts of things are called transverse holomorphic foliations, but uh, it's it's very much in the same spirit uh, of, of a holomorphic field theory. You just have some topological directions as well. So here, here's a, an example, uh, 4D minimally supersymmetric gang mills. So uh, the data to define such a thing is a group uh, representation, uh, though as, as Greg pointed out before, the actual appearance of the group will not appear for me, the Lie algebra will. Uh, representation for the group uh, that gives the data of what's called the chiral multiplet and uh, also a G invariant function on V. Um, and that's called the superpotential. The holomorphic twist I'll write as a derived mapping space. Um, but really what this is, uh, it's more accurately in the same spirit of the usual Yang mill. So it's some holomorphic gauge theory coupled to some holomorphic theory of matter. Um, so for example, if the matter representation is zero, so I just have a pure gauge theory, then the twist is what's called a holomorphic BF theory. And the action takes this, this very nice form. Um, here we're on, I'm just explaining the theory on flat space. So R4 became C2. Um, and I've written it in terms of a holomorphic volume form on C2, but I didn't have to. Uh, and this is the this is the action here. So if if you I, I didn't say what the physical fields are here, but here A is as it was in the Chern Simons case, so it's the zero one part of a connection on C2. Here I'm just taking to be the uh, the trivial bundle, so zero one connection of the trivial bundle, and here B is a function on C2, so a zero form. And the equations of motion, they're similar to the Chern Simons example. So for A, it, it does what I said, it, it deforms the complex structure in the trivial G bundle. And then B is just the data, it's some sort of linear data. It's like a Lagrange multiplier in this situation. So the equations of motion for B just say that that object is holomorphic for that new complex structure defined by A.
So uh, I wanted to say a little bit about a uh, twist of supersymmetric theories outside of Yang-Mills. Uh, so for example, supergravity and maybe some other non-Lagrangian theories. So I mentioned earlier, Costello and Lee defined this notion of supergravity back in 2018. Um, it's generalizing the procedure I just mentioned before, and it goes along the lines basically what Greg Moore had said. It's defined to be supergravity in some background where the odd ghost takes on some non-zero vacuum expectation value. Um, with Engmar Severi back in 2020, we characterized the holomorphic twist of the abelian six dimensional superconformal theory, as well as some twists of supergravities. And what we did was we, we, we gave two arguments here um, that actually span two different papers. But one argument for the six dimensional theory was using the actual component field description. And we just did some like sort of 40 page computation that was pretty gnarly and, and got a nice description of the, of the twist. But there's a structural way to do it as well. And this is why I introduced this no potence variety before. So the point is, is that this, this if, if you know of a supersymmetric multiplet that comes from the pure spinner construction, as I outlined before, there's a really easy way you can twist it um, because twisting commutes uh, with this pure spinner construction. So what you can do is you can actually twist the no potence variety itself. And what I mean is the following thing. So this original no potence variety Y, that was describing all the square zero supercharges in your original super algebra, the supersymmetry algebra. But given a, a fixed Q, which is square zero, I can define the twisted no potence variety by looking at the analogous object defined now for the twisted supersymmetry algebra, which is a much, much easier thing to describe. This thing is, is much smaller than the original supersymmetry algebra. So these varieties are a lot easier to describe um, and to work with. And uh, if, we, if we apply this, this observation that twisting commutes with this procedure, um, we, we obtain a bunch of, we, we obtain the twists of a bunch of very important supersymmetric theories, so, uh, or supersymmetric multiplets. So for example, we, we do this to the abelian 60 superconformal theory um, we can also do it for 11D supergravity. Um, and uh, we didn't write down the full action functional from the supersymmetric theory, but we did uh, write down what we expect to be the action functional. And we showed that it satisfies the master equation. So it defines, it's a well-defined uh, classical field theory. And uh, if I get to it later, this Lee superalgebra will come up. But what we found uh, is sort of a surprising appearance of this symmetry by an exceptional Lie superalgebra in the case of 11D supergravity, namely the Lie superalgebra, which Katz classified and called E5 slash 10. Um, and that was with uh, Ingmar and uh, Surya Regavendron as well. So, so in these twisted supergravity theories, what, what 10 and in, in 10 and 11 dimensions say, what 10 and 11 dimensional or in eight dimensions, what conditions are are you are are necessary on the manifolds in order to carry out these twistings? Are they arbitrary eleven dimensional manifolds, for example, in this thing at the in this thing you've mentioned at the bottom, or do they have to satisfy some differential equations or or what? So I'll say that we've only done the easiest thing, which is to work on flat space. And so, so we found sort of backgrounds on flat space. Uh, and they're really the only interesting thing is the square zero supercharge. There's not really any other uh, background fields that you need to turn on. Um, but I expect that you should be able to do this on more general geometries, which have to do something with the complex structure. So my naive expectation would be that you could write down, uh, you could write down this, uh, you, you, you could make sense of these twists on, say, arbitrary Calabi-Yau manifolds, or maybe Calabi-Yau manifolds that, uh, yeah, yeah. Let, let me just okay, say Okay, but that. that's, that's what know. I was looking for. It's the, some kind of condition. I mean, it's not going to be an arbitrary smooth 11 manifold, right? Right. You at least need, or at least in 10D, you need Calabi-Yau. Um, my experience is that for theories of conformal supergravity, you can get away with less than Calabi-Yau. So really all you need is like a Kähler structure. Um, 
but that, that that's sort of the flavor of of the geometric structure that I have in have in mind here. Uh, I think there's there's more general uh, backgrounds that you could discuss, which are you would certainly call natural to the world of complex geometry, but I haven't thought much more about about that in any specific oh, example. Okay. I mean, what yeah. I have in the back of my mind is that uh, with Martin Rochek and Vivek mm. Saxon, we talked about a twisted supergravity, but we, we that was in four dimensions, but it would apply to any smooth four manifold. Ah, uh -huh. to connect the two, connect the two things. So I mean, yeah, like, yeah, yeah I, I, four manifold. I know of your work and also this uh, work of Zohar Komargotsky about about the sort of classifying four D supersymmetric backgrounds. I think you could, yeah, it would be very interesting. Yeah, I think Zohar also had to put, you know, differential. Con he, he had to solve some differential equations. Yeah, yeah, and uh, what I'm saying is that. Those differential equations are certainly here, but I haven't thought about it in any interesting case, uh, only flat space okay, so thanks. far. Yeah. The moduli problems that we write down after twisting certainly make sense in more generality than on flat space, which is why I'm ventured to expect that you could perform this from like the original theory defined on some interesting background. But uh, yeah, sort of doing that successfully has not been done in any intricate example, I would say yet. Uh, okay. so. Let me uh, now transition to talking about some techniques to study holomorphic QFT. So the, the first problem in any quantum field theory, or at least any perturbative quantum field theory, is to make sense of the path integral. And this, this problem is as old as the subject itself. For topological theories, renormalization is pretty well understood. It's what's called ultraviolet finite in the sense that Feynman integrals converge without needing to introduce any complicated things like counter terms. Um, those, those sorts of counter terms uh, aren't, we don't really like as mathematicians or as physicists. They may depend on some schemes some choices are involved. Um, so it's always nice when you have a UV finite theory. Topological theories are such. A uh, way, way to see this uses some nice uh, the existence of some nice compactifications of configuration spaces for which these integrals can be extended to. Um, and this goes back to work in the 90s, Axelrod Singer, Maxim Kutsevich, and Alberto Catania, uh, just to name a few, ma many, many, many other people that I'm not mentioning there. Um, to first order in perturbation theory, uh, it's known that holomorphic theories are finite as well, U UV finite. Uh, this originally goes back to Costello Lee in the context of those holomorphic theories which arise from topological strings like holomorphic transimons that I mentioned before. Um, and uh, I, I, I sort of develop it more generally for more general holomorphic theories as well. And then recently, uh, Ming Hao Wang, he's a postdoc here at BU, has shown that in fact, holomorphic theories are UV finite to all orders in perturbation theory, just as it is for TFT. So this is a very nice feature of holomorphic theories. We don't have to worry about some of the analytic complications, which sort of go hand in hand with uh, ordinary Ramanian sorts or Lorentzian quantum field theories. Um, and, and morally, if you want to view this from the lens of supersymmetry, it's so, sort of what it's saying is that what's going on in the background is some version of supersymmetric cancellation of, of, of anomalies or of like divergences. Uh, I can talk about holomorphic theory absent of any existence of supersymmetry, but at least those which come from a supersymmetric theory, the, the fact that the twists are so easy analytically basically comes from an, an argument like this, I would say, or a, a feature like this of the, of the supersymmetric theory. Um, speaking of anomalies, uh, so that, that's another feature of a, of a quantum field, uh, field theory, of course. And because the renormalization is so well understood, anomalies are also really easy to characterize for holomorphic theories. Um, so very, very, very generally, at least at the, at the level of one loop, these are given as a fixed sum over wheel Feynman integrals, which a fixed number of vertices. So for example, 10 to Yang Mills, uh, that's anomalous and it's holomorphic twist, also anomalous, no surprise. And uh, the anomaly there is given by a hexagon. Uh, or, well, it's a wheel with six incoming edges that I could draw like a hexagon if I wanted to. Um, and it's represented by the following uh, 
uh, Lagrangian densities. This is a way of, of representing this anomaly here. So it's uh, it's sixth order, um, really fifth order in the gauge field, and then there's a single appearance of the ghost here. C is the ghost for the holomorphic gauge symmetry, uh, uh, um, which which is the usual gauge transformation, except I only pick up the zero one component of the derivative. Um, Costello and Lee show. I, I mentioned the case of of holomorphic transimons and three dimensions earlier. This is about holomorphic transimons in five dimensions. So they also show how a version of the holomorphic green shorts can be used to cancel this anomaly too. Um, and I don't know if I'm gonna get to it, but there's also holomorphic analogs of gravitational anomalies. So these are uh, anomalies to quantizing a classical symmetry by holomorphic diffeomorphisms. And th these are closely related to Ramanian or Lorentzian gravitational anomalies together with some R symmetry anomalies as well, which I'll, I'll try to say a, a precise statement of that soon. Okay, the, the next feature of a quantum field theory I want to point out is the uh, uh, algebra of local operators. So as I said before, a chiral conformal field theory can be described by a vertex algebra. This was geometrized by Balance and Drinfeld using chiral or their version of factorization algebras. Similarly, in a topological field theory, we know that the theory of EN algebras gives a nice model for local operators. Those are algebras over the operator of little n disks. And um, each of these are instances of a more general notion of a factorization algebra. Um, so I, I'll say very briefly what a factorization algebra is here, but it, it, it's, it's, it's a structure which underlies the local operators in any quantum field theory. And Costello and Gulliam gave a, a nice systematic construction of this. And I just want to note that factorization algebras have the technology to not just encode local operators, but also operators of positive dimension, like line operators. You'll use them properly. Um, let me not go through this definition right now, but let me just say uh, back to EN algebras. So for topological field theories, at least in dimension bigger than one, this the ordinary product of operators is, is pretty commutative. Uh, indeed, at the level of cohomology, the structure is determined by basically just a commutative product together with a bracket of some cohomological degree. And this is really Witten's descent bracket. Uh, it can be computed very explicitly using the factorization product as in this formula here. Um, so here, uh, O and O prime are local operators. I've placed O at the origin. That's what this O of zero indicates. And then I've, I've performed this Witten's descent. So what I've done is I've taken O prime and I have, I've extended it to not a uh, uh, local operator, but really a form valued local operator. So it's a local operator which takes values in differential forms. And this thing has this, this, this extension has to satisfy these descent relations, which are this equation here. Um, but as long as it does satisfy this extension, this definition above doesn't depend on the lift that I chose. Um, and it gives me a well defined bracket. Uh, this bracket. Uh, together with the product, form an algebra structure called a PN algebra. So it's like a Poisson algebra, where, but this bracket carries some non-trivial degree. And you could try to do something exactly identically, uh, exactly the same for holomorphic QFT. And the the simplest thing to try to do is to uh, work at the level of cohomology, just as we did uh, in the topological case here. And I should say, developing a model for higher dimensional Chiral or vertex algebras, um, I've been thinking about, so, so not, not working with cohomology, but really at the co-chain level, I've been thinking a bit about with um, Zhang Ping Gui, um, and see also some, some work of John Francis and uh, Dennis Gates Corey from uh, about 15 years ago or so. The difference here is that descent is rather, is, is much more interesting. Uh, in this holomorphic case. So just considering the operator product between two operators, so that is looking at 
the configuration space of two points. Here, I'm just working with a holomorphic theory on affine space. The operations are controlled by this configuration space. So um, because we're working with a holomorphic theory, what they're controlled by is the coherent or the um, Delbar cohomology of this, of this uh, algebraic variety. And in degree zero, we actually don't get anything very interesting. This is basically Hartog theorem. So the point is, is that uh, configuration space, uh, this thing's more or less equivalent to punctured affine space. Um, just like it is in dimension one, configuration space of two points, that's just the punctured disk. But the difference is, is that this punctured thing is not affine. So it has higher cohomology. So in, in degree zero, its cohomology is just functions on the affine end space. So it doesn't see the point that you removed at all. That's Hartog theorem. So all of the juice is somehow happening in higher dimension. And it turns out that there's only cohomology in a unique degree bigger than zero, that is degree n minus one. Notice that's the same degree of the dimension of the, uh, the same dimension of the degree of the bracket that we had in a topological theory. And in, in this degree, the cohomology has this nice form. Um, so you can model it using, like I said, Dolbo cohomology if you want to. That's the second description here. Or you could model it using some check cohomology for your favorite cover of, of punctured affine space. That's really like the first description. But in any case, and any element in here defines a degree n minus one bracket via descent, almost identically to how Witten did it for uh, topological theories. Um, I'll just leave this formula up here for, for a second, but I'll say that sort of developing this and, and studying the sort of precise algebraic properties has been some, appeared in some recent work of Davide Gaiotto and, and um, some students of his, uh, Culp and Wum. And they, they do some examples of this. Um, so uh, it's now four o'clock. I forget, did I start on time or did I uh, start a little bit? Well, let's just say a few more minutes. Yeah, I'll go for a few more minutes. So I think this, this fits nicely into some of the things I was saying before. So uh, I'll, I'll try to say a few, to tie it back to, to um, my view of holomorphic field theory as a sort of higher dimensional version of conformal field theory. So the defining symmetry in a conformal field theory is called the Virasor algebra. So there's a central extension of what's called the Witt algebra. Those are vector fields on the punctured disk. And it's a very explicit central extension defined by this uh, familiar looking two cycle. Now I wrote it in an unfamiliar way, maybe it involves, I've written in terms of this Jacobian, but that's because the formula I'll write down later is, is similar to this. And in this last part, uh, I'll say I'm gonna discuss two enhancements, but actually I'm just gonna discuss one. Uh, the one that I'm not gonna discuss is, uh, is related to this AGT correspondence or an enhancement of this AGT correspondence um, uh, using, using the perspective of holomorphic QFT. But I just wanna focus on an enhancement of the symmetry in higher dimensions. So just the analog of this Virasoro algebra in higher complex dimension. I'm just gonna focus on n equals two. Uh, well, let, let, me, let me say some things for general end first. So as I just said before, if I just replace the punctured disk with the punctured higher dimensional disk and I look at holomorphic vector fields, I actually don't find anything more, anything interesting. I don't find anything new. In the sense that the vector fields, the holomorphic vector fields on the punctured disk don't see the point at all. Don't see the point that I removed at all. This is again, Hartog theorem. And what this tells you is that you should really be working with derived sections because the punctured disk is not affine in higher dimensions. So the replacement for this Witt algebra that I talked about before is a DG Lee algebra that I get by looking at the derived sections of the tangent sheaf on the punctured disk. And if I wanted to work with an analytic model, I could look at the Dolbeau complex of the tangent bundle. That's the one zero tangent bundle, the holomorphic one. And I'll refer to this either model for this as the Witt algebra. So it's a, it's a nice DG Lee algebra. The bracket here is just the bracket of holomorphic vector fields, which I've extended to 
uh, uh, the Dobo complex in a, in a linear way. Uh, well, not in a linear way, but by the rule that it's a derivation. By derivation. The next obvious question is, well, I define this DG Lie algebra. Does it have any interesting central extensions? Does it have a version of the central charge? And I can pick out uh, at least a very nice class of central charges coming from a certain degree cohomology, Lie algebra cohomology of vector fields just on the end disk. And it turns out that in any dimension, these central charges are labeled by characteristic classes of a certain degree, namely degree 2n plus 2. So in particular, when n equals 2, that's complex two dimension. There's a two-dimensional space of things that you should call central charges, parameterized by the cube of the first Chern class and C1 times C2. Those are the degree six classes in BU2, cohomology of BU2. Brian, so in fact, oh one, yeah, maybe. I'll, yeah. Okay, this will be my last slide. So uh, this is sort of a theorem then. So in fact, given any one of these versions of the central charge, uh, you can construct a holomorphic factorization algebra which I'll call Vir sub C, which is defined on any complex surface. And it's really the an analog of the usual Vir Soro vertex algebra. In fact, it shares a nice direct relationship to the Vir Soro vertex algebra. So if I start with one of these uh, higher dimensional factorization algebras, it's labeled by something I called the higher dimensional central charge. There I have two coefficients, C1 cubed, C1, C2. And say I place this on a, on a surface, which is of the form C times sigma, where sigma is just another Riemann surface. Then I can push forward. I can compactify along sigma to get a vertex algebra on C, which is just, which I can model by a vir, uh, vertex algebra. And it turns out that this is exactly the Virasoro vertex algebra. And it has this very precise central charge in terms of the higher dimensional central charges and the geometry of the Riemann surface sigma. Um, so this is really a, a nice lift of the of the usual Virasoro. I could also extract an algebra by pushing forward along, um, compactifying out the three sphere. That's a co-dimension one thing in C two, and I get a nice associative algebra, which is a higher analog of the of the usual Virasoro associative algebra uh, or Lie algebra. Um, and you, you can make very precise the, the sort of formulas defining the central extension, which. Well, right there, but I'll stop my talk now. Sorry for going over. All right. Let's thank Brian for a wonderful talk. So we have time for a few questions. If you want to raise your hand. Tudor. Hey, Brian, thanks. Um, you, you, talked, you talked about a lot of the uh, perturbative features of, of quantization in a, in a holomorphic field theory. Um, what, what sort of non-perturbative effects show up? Um, or is, like, is anything, yeah. is, is anything known? Are there like corrections in, um, in, in quantization or to anomalies or what, um, I would, I, I would say that, I, I guess holomorphy has been used for a long, long time to say things about non-perturbative sort of properties of quantization in a quantum field theory. Um, and I don't think I've found anything sort of new in that, in, in that direction. And I, I, yeah, I, I don't think I really have anything to say about the non-perturbative aspects of a holomorphic quantum field theory though. Um, Yeah, okay. I don't have any. Yeah. Asan? Can you hear me? Uh, um, yeah, I do. Sorry, yeah. So uh, this UV finite result, uh, UV finiteness result that you mentioned, uh, does it also hold in the presence of boundaries? So for mixed polymorphic topological. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I would expect the answer is yes. Um, but I don't know of a proof. Uh, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So it's so not I'll in this work, but by I'll say with, uh, no. So I'll say actually with Ming Hao, we're writing up a follow-up paper to his original result, which is just about holomorphic theories to extend it to these partially holomorphic topological theories. Mm -hmm. 
but still working on manifolds without boundary. I see. But it's sort of the next ingredient that I think one would need to try to say something about a manifold with boundary, or at least the sort of, you would hope that the sort of analysis we're doing there could be used to, to say something about mm -hmm. quantization on manifolds with boundary. Yeah, but it, as far as I know, it's, it's unknown, and, but I, I would expect there to be a, a similar UV finiteness uh, uh, property, yeah. Okay, so it's expected it's really to be, question. you expect it to still hold. I expect it to still hold. Yeah, I, I yeah, I expect it to still hold. I, I didn't. Yeah, I expect it to still hold. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, one more question, Greg. Uh, yes. Well, actually, I have a two-part question. Sorry, Dan. Uh, part one: um, Is there any relation to uh, the uh, derived conformal algebra of Kapranov? Oh, that's such a good question. Yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, Kapranov's model uses, uh, he comes up with a model using some twister construction, if you've looked at the paper. Uh, but what we found, I think, is, a, is another derived model for that conformal algebra. I see. Um, and moreover, we were able to generalize that conformal model to a super conformal setting as well. I see. And okay. at least in one example, what we found out was it's actually the, it's a derived model, which underlies the stress tensor in a super conformal theory. So it's really, it's really the thing that physicists know, have known about all this time. Uh, namely, there's just a, there's, there's a derived Lie algebra, which controls the stress tensor in an arbitrary super conformal theory. And it's that thing. And that, that's really like the derived sort of, Analog of the the supersymmetric ver the, the the supersymmetric version of Kapranov's uh, derived conformal algebra. Uh, okay, yeah. cool. And part two, uh, you you alluded to a, an old work I did with uh, Losa, Nikrasov, and Shadashvili, and this these formulas you're writing at the end are a little reminiscent of the higher of the Botchern forms that we were using to get higher dimensional uh, analogs of the Polyakov action. And it's yeah. So I was just wondering if you'd done any comparisons. Absolutely. I haven't done any comparisons. I would say that I'm, I was extremely inspired by your work, but I have not gone back and tried to okay, this see how it exactly very, this fits. This formula, in. this co-cycle yeah. you wrote down here, it looks like a higher, looks like it might be related to those. But sure. Yeah. A co -cycle. We got certain we we got certain co cycles for I think diffeomorphisms in six dimensions from Botchern or uh, uh, forms. Do you only see like bilinear co cycle? Like, are they always like bilinear? Or are they no, like, they no, they're not. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Well, maybe this is a good point to continue offline. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And let me say that the uh, next and last of this academic year in this series will be in three weeks on May 6th. We have Jacques Distler, who will soon send in his title and abstract. And let's thank Brian again for a great talk. Thanks. Thank you. I did it not stop recording. Stop recording. All right. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Thanks a lot, Brian. Is Greg? Yeah. Thanks. Greg is gone. Oh well. Hey, hey Brian. I I think, I I I think what you're calling the Witten bracket might be the, uh, Benz v, Beam Balamore Nitsky de Mofte bracket. Um, oh great! Uh, using I use that. using uh using Witten's notion of descent. Um, okay, that's the words I should use. I wasn't sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I assume Witten wrote down the bracket, but I'm a, I apologize. I, uh, I don't. I don't think he did. He 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 invented descendants to describe Donaldson theory, like to describe Donaldson invariants. I see. Um. Um. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sorry, I'll. I'll, I'll uh... I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected as well. I, I don't. I don't think he did anything quite like that. Though, if he had thought about it longer, he probably could have.